the hell is happening? Is Carrick doing a preview? It must be an alternate world. Yes, it is. You know, you guys know on this channel, I just don't do that many previews of video games. So I think the last one I did was Watch Dogs. But recently, Larian Studios said, hey, man, you want to come down? They started the email like that. Hey, man. No, they didn't. Do you want to come down to San Francisco and you want to check out Baldur's Gate 3, the early access, the alpha? Now, that's pretty hard for me to pass up. I am a Divine Divinity fan. I played those. I played Beyond Divinity. I played, of course, Divinity Original Sin, and I cut my teeth on the original Baldur's Gate, on Icewind Dale and Baldur's Gate 2 and Throwing a Ball and all of those amazing titles and their expansions. That was really difficult to pass up. I did have to figure out how to get down there, though, because as you guys know, I do not take money for trips or anything like that. So getting down there, if you guys want to hear some of the crazy shenanigans that occurred then when we all jumped in a car and decided to drive down to San Francisco, uh, you can check out the podcast at 1030 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, where we're going to be talking more about this as well as some other exclusives that you'll see from me uh, coming on different games. So I would love for you guys to show up. Now, with this video, I want you guys to know I would have let this thing pretty much just run and intersperse a little bit here and there, but they did say very distinctly in the embargo that they wanted us to talk about what we saw and not to just post the video. So you will hear from me as we go through this video. I apologize. That's pretty much just what they want. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump into it. If you like the video, I would love for you to subscribe, hit the notification bell for all of the upcoming content. Let's begin. So good to meet you. Calm yourself. I'm sure right away some of you guys are noticing something that will pop up that says, listen to origin story. So we were informed that those origin stories will be playable. They just didn't have them ready yet. You'll be able, I think you were able to listen to them, but he didn't actually play them for us. What the origin stories are is just like out of Dragon Age Origins. You will be able to actually play a bit of their origin story, and then it will play out and sort of make more sense to those very specific characters in the main game. Now, you don't need to do that. He made that clear. But if you wanted to, if you wanted something a little bit more narrative driven for those starting characters, you can do that. Interestingly enough, especially for characters like this, he also said that their origin stories will matter in the gameplay. For instance, you can pick this character who is a vampire pawn and he won't be able to cross water and things like that or shouldn't be able to. We're going to see sort of what goes on there. The main story starts out with all of you guys getting a worm in your head from the Mind Flayers. You have a couple days until the Mind Flayer worm turns you into Mind Flayers, but it also allows you to talk to anybody else who has these worms in them. And this change is a process known as seromophosis, so you'll hear that a lot in the gameplay. Now, you know me, I'm going to cover all elements, but I have to say that once again, we've just got their ability to nail a vibrant world. There's things moving all over in the game world and a feeling of everything being fairly dynamic, even though, again, this is an alpha. This is fairly early on, but I was quite surprised by some of the things that you could do and see. Let's listen to some of the sound as well. Better not push my luck. waste of perfectly good blood. One of the things you'll notice here as the video progresses is that a lot of the discussion actually occurs via the mind and occurs via suggestions and questions, but they actually aren't reflected back into the character speaking on the screen. I didn't get a chance to ask Sven if that was something that they would sort of go forward as in the game itself without your character really talking a lot in some of those cutscenes or how they were going to go about it. I think this was just very, very early. It's what she felt. Anger. Confusion. Resolve. Ah! Uh, you. You've got the same thing I do. In your head. I felt it. What's the matter with you? Has that tadpole scrambled your brain already? And right away, we see there's various different ways in which you can play. And Sven was open about the fact that it, not only is it evil and good, and then also based on various different stats and skills, but also on that origin story. So because you're a vampire, you're actually going to see various different skills popping up or various different questions and dialogue choices that are going to pop up that just further add flavor to that story and sort of solidify everything. Again, this being something this far away from release, I was really impressed by how much was actually going on day and date for this and how early it was. Find these doors, but I've barely made a dent in them so far. Hmm. 
I was thinking the same thing. Around the top of this cliff, perhaps. Hopefully there's no more of these creatures along the way. All just company for our final moments. But you're right. Whatever lies ahead will be a little less daunting with support. And here we do notice some elements where the game sort of pops. You'll see a little bit of uh, changes between the character animations when they ask a question and answer a question. This is something that we see a lot of times with that animation blending in different moments. But I think this is actually pretty far along. You have a lot of vocal intonation that you can actually see on the characters and a lot of different looks. You can see that almost puzzled look on her face and that sarcastic brow and the adjustment of her facial features. This is very ahead of its time for a lot of other games that we see in this genre, which was I was impressed about. I did ask a little bit about the technology and what adjustments we were seeing, and Sven made it clear that while a lot of the parts of Divinity Original Sin are here, including environmental attacks, which you're going to see here now, he also stated that there were some additions, which we'll see in this battle that they have put in, including the ability to jump. Now, I want to talk about this ability to jump for a second, but let's start out. First, it rolls the initiative, and then we see the enemies. Let's watch this for a second. Wicked little beasts. They'll down you in one strike. Here also, I'm sure you're noticing a lot of really good music that's involved in this already. A lot of very instrumental elements and a lot of woodwind work, which I actually like. You'll also notice that the spells have a nice good punch to them. I was actually impressed with the audio and where it was going here. When it comes to the HUD, you can see the various different elements and you have basically all of your moves from all of your characters on the lower bar. And then it'll cut to those cutscenes when you do critical hits with your specials. So he did pinned down, which stops it from moving, but he also killed it with a natural 20, I think. And that basically blows it up and that ended this part of the battle. So those battles are a lot like the battles that we saw in Divinity Original Sin and its sequel. But what we do see here and something that Sven made sure that uh, people understood is that there was going to be a lot of interaction with the environment. So what you see here is him blowing up an oil canister. That oil spreads everywhere and anything in the game world can be interactive with that is dynamic. So he dips the arrow in fire. You see the change to the bow and then shoots into the actual location and explodes that. But there are other parts in the game world that you can interact with as well. He just showed fire and one or two others. So there's a lot of environmental spell casting, not only with the magic users themselves, but also anything that's dynamic in the environment. And there you go. I think it's about time to talk about jump. Is it OP or is it overpowered? That was a question that was actually asked. It looked a little bit that way in the game. You're going to see some more footage of this uh, particular ability, which allows for characters to leap and explore in the game. One of the things Sven said is the game is filled with secrets because exploring is actually going to be very rewarding for the game player. That means going into locations won't just be scouring around on one plane of the horizontal. There was a lot of verticality and we see that in the game. A lot of having the high ground, as they would say in Star Wars. However, I will say that when I was watching the overall ability to jump, there were some elements that were OP. There was also some elements that ended up hurting him many times if the jump was too far up or down. So there's going to be a little bit of that risk reward. It didn't seem to be perfectly balanced, but this is way ahead of its time here. Uh, what I did see looked impressive and interesting for games and battles and how you could do those depending on which character was able to jump. 
There was also a great deal of environmental shortcuts that you're going to see later in the footage, and I'll make sure to point that out. So here we come upon the camp. Now, the camp is going to attract followers. It's going to attract companions. It'll be able to grow bigger, but they didn't actually show that. You go into the camp, you basically rest, and here you can have various different conversations with the other NPCs who are there with you. One missed opportunity here, or just something that they weren't allowed to do, we didn't get to see a lot of the other origin stories and this camp situation, because this does come up. You are a vampire, so there is some discussion of what you exactly do at camp when everybody else is asleep, and that sort of does pop up here. Would have liked to have seen a couple of those uh, other origin stories pop up. I think you see one more later in the footage. I did notice, at least, they seemed to purposely uh, be showing us various different NPCs at this part of the of the game. And I've always wondered, you know, will we see the recreation of some special character that was really, I think, a hallmark of the Baldur's Gate games? A little less so maybe some of the other games that came out later, like Icewind Dale, which was a little bit more combat focused. But I didn't see anybody here that was really grabby or over the top. However, I did see what I consider to be a good level, a good mid and high tier level of voice acting and character acting that we got in all of the NPCs that we're going to see. It felt very solid, very professional, and that means if anybody does end up jumping off the screen, at least to me, I feel we're going to see a huge increase in just how emotive that feels because everybody really nailed it. And this early, I was surprised to see those voice actors and actresses really already have a vested feeling for every single character. And we're going to see one of those characters now as this guy goes off to sleep. Alive. That's unexpected. Last I saw you, you were lying in a crucible's worth of blood. An intellect devourer nibbling at your ear. Glad to see my eyes deceive me. I'm Gale. Well met. Speechless. Might be the shock. We went through a traumatizing experience, if an instructive one. And there we see almost right away the excellent hand gestures and just overall fluidity in which the animations work with those characters and their bodies. It's not just their faces anymore. And there's some jerkiness here and there that'll certainly need to be cleared up. But you see a lot more emotive feeling within the hands and within the body stature and just the overall way in which they hold themselves. I think that is a huge step forward for storytelling and removes a lot of the wooden feeling that we get in a lot of their games. For a moment here, we're going to jump into the battle system. I'm going to jump the footage forward a bit. With the battle system, one of the things I always liked with Divinity Original Sin and many other games of this type, you can sort of set up the game world prior to the battle initiating. You can take things and adjust things so that it pays off for you in an upcoming battle. We see that, or we see the attempt by Sven a couple times here within the footage as he sort of sets up ambushes prior to actually triggering the discussion or triggering the ability or moment that sort of starts the fight. Now, this is going to be a little bit less organic than a normal game player would be because we don't know when some of these experiences would occur in the later game. But here he did know and he just wanted to show a little bit of the splitting of the various different characters and how that could work, how somebody could be set up for stealth, how somebody could be set up for the high ground, the low ground, what exactly they needed to do prior to the event happening. One of the things that he talked about was also very cool. There are characters in the game world that, of course, can raise the dead. One of the things he discussed is that you could technically go in, and if you sort of did it prior, you could steal the weapons and items from the skeletons in the game, and when they were risen from the dead and the necromancer did that, they wouldn't have their weapons, and they would have to go searching for them, and that would allow you a little bit of an easier battle, which I really liked. Ready? That's our ship. You're all hot air. Think you can get us to leave that bounty to you? Not a chance. 
Here you see Sven changing to the female to lead this discussion. I just don't know how many times that's going to happen in the game. That's a lot of different discussion that you have to write, but it came from her point of view there, as you would notice in those different choices that she had for narrative. Now, Sven purposely split off his guy here so he could show some stealth, but also show the shove move and... He's going to try that right now. Boom, shoves the character down. And so now he has the high ground and that character is prone, I think, for one round. What we're going to do is move forward a little bit. He ends up doing that battle, but didn't end up using the environmental, which is what I sort of wanted to see at that time. Sven was pretty open about some things not working exactly as they should, but also just the fact that the game sort of does what it does. And he ended up not doing incredibly well in that battle, but did kill the guys. But he ended up splitting up the party and going downstairs with some and staying outside with others. We're going to jump to the dungeon scenes because I want to show you some of the different stealth elements. You'll see red on the ground. That's where characters can see. And if you go into real time, uh, basically that everybody's moving in that real time. But if you go into the turn based, everybody moves in six or eight second increments. I can't remember which, and I apologize for that, but I didn't have that in my notes, but basically you move, then they move, then you move. Uh, even if they really don't know you're there for battle. Additionally, you can grab many items in the game world and use them to do crazy stuff like make steps or of course make places and traps for explosions later. While you're able to see all of the rules that you do, just like a lot of these games, one of the things that did come up is how exactly is stealth handled? Stealth is handled on three levels, basically none, light, and heavy, with each one of those offering their negatives or positives, that kind of thing when it comes to stealth. But watching some of the ways the rules were handled, I don't think anything's really exactly that surprising when it comes down to it. And anybody who's really aware of the way these guys make their games, as well as the rule sets that they'll be employing, should sort of be able to understand exactly how it's going to work. Real time is, of course, real time. And that turn based is just splitting that real time up into those sections of seconds. So it's all sort of right there. It's not something that's questioned. And it's not something that I think will cause a lot of confusion in the way it plays out. I do want to talk for a moment about the fiction of the the game world. This is something that I talked to various people that were at the event prior to the event. A lot of people didn't know exactly what to expect. They knew it was a Larian game. They'd played the Divinity games. Maybe they played Beyond Divinity or Divine Divinity like myself. And they had played the overall, the, the Baldur's Gate games, maybe the Icewind Dale games. So they knew what to expect from each one, but they didn't know exactly how that chocolate and peanut butter was going to come together. And I personally have to say, as I watch this being played, I do believe that this will be something that Larian has to struggle with because the context of the camera is a big deal and the adjustment and the way you interact between a 2D camera is far different than a 3D camera. And that's even more so when you go to like, let's say a third person, first person game like uh, Fallout to a Fallout 3. So we see this slight adjustment here with Divinity Original Sin, but as it continued to play and I sort of saw the fiction, I did sort of fight that feeling of, is this... It feels a little bit like Divinity Original Sin 3 versus Baldur's Gate 3. Now, I think the reason why that is is because we didn't see the origin stories. They weren't able to solidify us in the fiction right at the starting, which that's one of the reasons why I don't skip cutscenes at the starting of a lot of the videos that I play, a lot of the games that I play, because I want to feel like an introduction to the game world. And there was a very good introduction to the game world with a cutscene that makes you sort of understand that the mind flayers are the main bad guys in this game world. And by the way, they certainly are bad guys. But I think this will be something that they struggle with and something that they have to make sure really feels and resonates because it is a big change to Baldur's Gate. It is a massive change. There is a huge difference in the feeling between the two. And this is something that we've seen in all games that make that jump in camera and make that jump in presentation. So I'm very interested to see what they pull off. Next up, we're once again inside of the camp. Why is that? Well, we have the various characters together and we sort of get to see that interaction, but we also get to see a little bit more of the origin story overflow into the main story with this vampire character that you end up playing. And you actually have the ability to decide uh, if you want to suck them dry. What's also cool here is depending on that starting, you should actually be having problems with the change into the Mind Flayer. But what your characters or your side characters understand and start to note is that you're not. And that's a very cool part of the game's dynamic is that, again, that th those original stories will have a pretty big hit and pretty big impact going forward.
But I don't think anybody should worry about a normal character being left behind. These are just flavors. You can sort of take them if you want them. And if you don't, you're still going to have a lot of interaction, which we see in a little bit with other characters that don't have their original origin stories. I think this is really good for somebody jumping in. If you jump in, maybe an origin story makes more sense for you because you're not accustomed to, let's say, a Baldur's Gate world and you don't really know what's going on. And maybe this will give you a little bit more flavor text and just a little bit more of a solidification of what type of character you want to be, where if you played them all, then you can we'll go ahead and discuss combat just a little bit more. We'll jump forward. So basically, this is the next morning and you end up coming upon these two groups uh, discussing one group getting behind the gates to safety and the goblins are attacking them and they don't let them in. And so these people get attacked, but also you can join in. And what you see is one of the first and I think the biggest main scale battle that we saw in Baldur's Gate 3 so far, you get to see how the initiative system works, which, well, we've pretty much already seen. And you also get to see how various different heights in the game can affect the attacks and what you do. So we're going to go ahead and watch this. I really liked all the animation, all the graphics here. This is very far along for even, again, being something that's in alpha. There's a lot of good animations. Also noticed in, in various places, there was some clipping here and there, but in a lot of places, there were some really good animations and some really good collision detections on those. So a lack of, you know, that feeling where things aren't really touching or somebody grabs an item and their hand goes through it or doesn't really grab it. You don't get that as much here. A lot of also detailed I, I would say detailed work on animation and making sure that fingers like on her, the bow there fingers really holding things. So you get that first initiative. Now in the game, the person who gets the initiative first gets to attack first. That's pretty much the expectation. And you're going to see Sven here try to take on all these characters up the top left. You can see all of the different enemies and different other NPCs that are there. That does not include anybody on your team. Those are in the lower left. So top left might be NPCs that are fighting with you, but they're not within your controllable group. And of course, there's Sven with his shove, which he absolutely loved to do. Now, I didn't see shove be used against you, but he did say that the characters have like for like kind of skills. So you don't have to worry about you just having very particular things and no one else having them. We'll see here in a moment them toss over or or cast a spell and basically cause grease so they end up causing grease and of course you can light that on fire but it ruins people's ability to stand on it and it hinders them there's a lot of that environmental attacking that we saw uh as we sat down and sort of looked at this as this is going i gotta say you know sound effects i noticed were pretty good that music i was th thinking that it really did hit it didn't have the over the topness of baldur's gate one and two I, i'm sure a lot of you remember that iconic baldur's gate one and two when that music starts up icewind dale as well those title screens but we weren't ever really in the main title screen um well we were but we weren't in what i feel was the primary final title screen it was more just like baldur's gate and then they jumped into the character screens i could be wrong there uh there was some music playing and it was a very good but it didn't have that same bombastic feel and yes i use the term bombastic feel that the prior games have had i think that that's something uh that we'll, we'll see at a later time i also don't know who the composer is for this i don't think they said it and i didn't find it in any of the notes here you'll just see him moving around he's sort of identifying what characters can do what Sven said that they had had a couple issues here and there with various different character AI that they were trying to figure out in the battle systems and, and that weren't really in this as an alpha. They weren't really ready for prime time. But here, most of the stuff just seemed to work exactly as they expected, whether it was casting fire over water and causing steam, any kind of the interactives that you would expect, as well as once again, that height. Um, you will see a critical hit there. You will see some characters also uh, missing a lot. And I was quite surprised by that. And I think that was just the demo. So if you see that behind us and you see a lot of characters come up and swing in, that became a joke as the game went on. Some characters would hit for sure enemies. But when it came to a lot of battles, there were times where you're just like, dude, why can this guy not hit this other guy? So that's going to be interesting to see how they play that out, what the percentages are, depending, of course, on what that difficulty is that everybody chooses. And speaking of difficulty, you'll notice that a lot like Divinity Original Sin, but less so like a lot of other games, there's a lot of range in the battle, a lot of long distance attacks that you'll see. Not only that jump, but you saw that fireball hitting. You really do have to be prepared, just like the prior games uh, that they've made. You have to really be prepared for characters being able to hit you. And if you're not looking and really tracking where everybody is, it's quite easy to think, oh, I'm safe here and find out that no, in fact, you're not safe at all. And what I want to cut here 
two before I end this up and give you a summary is uh, some of the choices you can make. Here's a character inside of a cage and you get to decide to take them out or not. Tiefling, if you ever had it to begin with. And at this time, Sven said, hey, what do you guys want to do? And then also talked about Twitch interaction, which is where the actual characters uh, and their choices can also be given over to Twitch watchers if you're streaming the game and they can uh, decide how things go. And basically, we all chose evil. There's a reason why. He said he was going to kill this character anyway, even if we didn't for a reason. In the game, you get a character's ring that basically allows you to talk to the dead you can actually do that on all the characters you kill and sometimes get information from them. So this character is dead and we actually are talking to the recently dead and getting information. One of the cool things Sven said was while that works, you can only talk to them and only get information up to the point that they died. So you can't get anything after that, but you can find out data about, you know, where they're from, about their tribes, which is what he's doing here. I wasn't able to ask Sven if you were able to use this on characters like the skeletons that we took the items from and then when they resurrected, they had no weapons. I didn't get a chance to find out if you can use it on everything. I think it's more along the lines of somebody that you've recently killed. So if there's a character there, maybe you'll be able to do it if they're a plot character. Maybe you can do it to everybody, but that question wasn't asked and it wasn't answered. And this was one of those situations where you were just watching him play. We weren't really throwing out a bunch of questions. So as I finish this up, I just want to say thanks once again to them for allowing me to come down and visit. Thanks to you guys for watching this. There was a lot of different questions that I had, um, some answered, some not, just due to how busy it was. I think when you look at this, w one of the things I discussed is it will be sort of difficult for them to nail down that feeling of Baldur's Gate because there's almost a golden hued, almost a cell shaded, not cell shaded, but like a cartoonish coloring and overall fantasy feel to the original Baldur's Gate games where there's almost a dry more realistic and clinical color scheme that we see in not only the Divinity Original Sin games, but we see here in this footage, almost like if you've seen a Fallout game and the filter that they use, there's no filter here, there's no fantasy filter, which is fine, there's no issue there, but I do feel that those two things combined, the camera change and that, will cause some people to sort of take a little bit of adjusting to sort of jump into it and be like, this is Baldur's Gate. It won't take very long, and I think when we see those initial cutscenes, and we see the uh, original stories for some of these characters and all of that, it'll probably have no issue sort of pulling us in. But I, I definitely noticed when I was watching it that that was popping up and that was something that had sort of had sort of become an issue as I was watching it. When looking at my notes here, there is some various things that I had when it comes to the checks and the way the dice work. This is all stuff that we would normally expect. You have different checks for, you know, everything from charisma to talk your way past something to you know, picking a lock, those kind of things. Different characters, of course, can do different things that others can't. So somebody may have a higher lock pick skill. Those are all stuff we all remember from Baldur's Gate and pretty much any fantasy game. To me, what I saw was really ahead of where I expected it to be. This is something where we see all these games all these times, and this is no disrespect to developers because they all develop in different ways. But we see these games a lot of times come and, and you sort of can tell that they're not ready for prime time. This game had a couple bugs, a couple issues, but I was actually really surprised again, and I've said this twice or two or three times in this video, I was really surprised where it was uh, for what we got. I think that that's a, a benefit to everybody and certainly is in some way a kudo to these guys and their engine and their ability to move things forward in this engine. We do see some new abilities and, and things that uh, I think a lot of us didn't expect, and there was some stuff hidden you know, that we're not going to get a chance to see when it comes to, uh, you know, something this early. Again, in the fall, early access for this. It was fun to go to, you know. I'm going to cover more of these previews when I get a chance. Uh, you know, make sure you subscribe to the channel to see those. And we'll continue to be talking about this on the podcast. Also, we're going to be covering a couple games, uh, one from Focus Home exclusive on the podcast, 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on, on ACG on Twitch this Friday. So if you come by, we'll be covering this uh, I'll be a answering any questions I can answer about this. I'll try to do that in the comments section as well, but probably won't get a chance. So if you want those uh, questions answered, feel free to come to the Twitch channel and uh, and ask those if you have any questions about this. But I think music-wise and lore-wise and, and just the way it felt, they've come a long way. There's some stuff there, but, uh, it, it, you know, 
if there's a company out there that I would say, man, I'm really glad they got it, it is Larian Studios. They just, it feels right, right? Feels right, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's it for me, I think. Yeah, that's it for me. Anyway, I would love for you guys to, if you get a chance, check out and Reddit and Twitter and Facebook and all that shit. Uh, thumbs up the video if you like it. Thumbs down if you didn't. Uh, that's it. Oh, you can become a patron on the Patreon website. It helps me, well, helps me go to these events and stuff like that, but it also helps me give you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Buy a copy of every single game. Even the, the dev gives me a code. Recently reviewed as of this morning, Beautiful Desolation. So if you guys get a chance, check that review out. Expect more from me of this kind of video in the future as well as some other stuff. But we're a review-based channel. That's the most you'll see from me. Thank you also to Cadiz for going with me to the event. It was a blast. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.